Okay, today we're going to be doing Pops 3, which is in Somerset. Um, and as I said, uh, because of time today, and I'm a bit irate about the uh, not being able to craft. Um, so let's get, let's get started. It's, it's uh, 2.41 actually. So, um, we're going to get started. And have we got the control? Yes, we have. Dorothy's on the floor today with my chips, which are now going to break. It will we'll be okay still, anyway. Um, does anyone know about Goff's Cave? No. Anyone ever heard of it? Goff's Cave. Goff's. G O G H S. You are a babe. Wow. I always take notes from the way you have it. That's good. That's good. Yeah. G-O-U-G-H-S, Goff's Cave, Cheddar, right, okay, good, on me, because I am absolutely amazing, as you all well know, Dorothy knows that, and Dorothy is amazing as well, and Dorothy, we are going to miss you, well I'm going to miss you for 10 minutes, but everyone else is going to miss you for 5, why are we going to miss Dorothy, she's not going on a bender on the weekend, so, um, one thing I want to start off with is to put a few things in context before we get into Goff's Cave proper. And I'm just going to paraphrase a lot of this. Uh, I found this from the uh, British Geological Society uh, website, and I've, I've, I've done a, there's a lot of stuff to go through today. Um, it's, a it's a really nice lecture, actually. Anyway, Ice Age and our landscape before we go on to Goff's Cave. Uh, as I probably mentioned uh, before, the, we're in a geological uh, period known as um, the Pleistocene, okay? The Pleistocene is the name that we give to all the current ice age. The current ice age um, is divided into the Devensian, uh, the late, the Devensian period, uh, which ends 12,000 years ago, and it ends that into our period, which is the Holstocene. And the Holstocene is a warm period in the ice age. Hopefully I've made that clear. But, H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E. -E. So in other words, we're still in an ice age because we've still got ice on the ice caps. Um, I know I've already done this, but I wanted to make it a little bit more clearer because it's very important today uh, because next week we're looking at mammoths and wolves in particular, and then we're talking about this land bridge here with no given sense between Britain and Ireland, how the trees go over to Ireland and all the rest of it. That's what we're doing in two weeks' time. So, here we go. This itself shows um, where the ice was 12,000 years ago. This is the ice sheet, okay? The blue area, most of this blue area all the way up to here was dry land, okay? This was all dry land, but this was not part of the ice sheet. This was just the land uh, that was 100 meters lower than the present water level, because that's how much ice is tapped up into the ice sheets. So that's the ice sheet proper. So here we go. Um, today, 10% of the world is covered by ice. Back then, 12,000 years ago, 30%. So you can imagine the amount of ice trap. This is very interesting. Probably um, <coughs> um, another period at the bank, another very cold period within the Pleistocene period, another sort of um, ice age itself, um, approximately 100,000 years ago, uh, the ice sheet above London was three miles high. And how do we know that? I'm an archaeologist, so I can say I don't know how they know that. But anyway, some other some other nice little facts. Um, this little bit is wrong here. It says humans first arrived in Britain at least 800,000 years ago. We know that they were here before. Uh, Recolonized after major glaciations to leave a pattern of occupation closely related to the planet. So what, what that's saying <laughs> is every time it got uh, warm in Britain, i.e. a period that we're in now, the Holocene period, whenever it got warm, people were coming into Britain. Um, and that's indicating whenever it got cold, they went away. We know that they didn't go away. Because the Goths came 14,000 years ago, there were people living, and that was one of the coldest periods of the last period of glaciation, okay? People have always lived in Britain when there's ice, um, except there were more people living in Britain when there was less ice. That's a very important point. These people, we know, left um, their evidence behind in, in the way of the old piece of um, skeletal remains. These hand axes here, um, <laughs> with, with um, hand axe, 
His hand axe is definitely placed to, um, is de definitely um, um, from uh, the period when we've got still uh, glacial ice on Britain 12,000 years ago. Uh, this is um, a hand axe, as you can see, nicely placed for the hand. And then after 12,000 years ago, uh, flint tools that snow on a hole. It's a little lithic, um, little, little lithic arrowheads about this size, the size of your little finger um, for hunting down game birds and so on. So that's that 12,000 years on. Uh, this is um, 12,000 years ago, these hand axes. These are often found associated with caves, found on beaches as the ice melt, melted and people left these on the landscape. This is another Paleolithic um, flint. Uh, this is this is made of flint. This is made of chert, actually. This is another uh, piece of material um, that uh, their tools would have been made of in the past. Uh, it says flint there, but that is not that known as chert, which is very um, similar to flint. Um, they can always get it right. Um, the sense of butchering animals, um, human carcasses for meat. We've got a lot of information about that today. Um, Next week, we'll be understanding um, the giant mammoths. Uh, we've got the likes of hyena and rhinoceroses wandering across Britain. Rhinoceroses and hyena wandering across Britain when it was in warmer periods, such as today, coming all the way over from the continent. The reason why we don't have the rhinoceros in Britain today and the hyena is because we've got no land bridge. Um, that's simply it. In cold periods, it was quite common to have the woolly mammoth, the wolf, um, elk, bison, bear, and saber tooth tiger, obviously, my name probably associated with the earlier period. So, the, these, these next, unfortunately, um, the description underneath these two beasts is completely wrong, uh, so we'll do it my way. That, that, that there is not an elk, it's a reindeer, and that's an elk or a moose. Now, there's something that I've been um, leading you down on the garden path about, okay? Which, admittedly, all archaeologists make this mistake. It's easy to say, if I open it there, you would avoid, because they would want to eat you as well. Uh, and you would probably see these, um, an elf like this, which had antler vines, which were as high as that beam there, huge beasts. Uh, th from there, all the way over to here, a massive elf, can you imagine? Uh, about that that wide, a huge thing. I always say that these are nice little animals that um, really wouldn't do you any harm, right? But I've made the big mistake of thinking because they're herbivores, they're not going to do you any harm, okay? We know that if you're standing here, and there's a male elk standing there, a big buck standing in front of you, he will kill you. He will outrun you, he will trample you down, and you will be dead. So these are very dangerous animals indeed. And as we know, wandering across a field, don't be fast, a big herd of cows <laughs> coming towards you. We know that two or three people every year are killed by cows. Um, and you're quite likely, if you've got two or three deer cutting in a field, you're not going to stand a chance against these deer either, which are rather big. So, that's the nasty stuff put away, but these, does that look like one, does that look wonderful? Does that look like as if they've been collected from Pompeii? No. Cool. In fact, those wonderful hazelnuts, not in the glass jar, they didn't they weren't found already in the glass jar on the beach, no. Um, those, those hazelnuts themselves, the description is these fossilized hazelnuts were found in a submerged forest. One of them still bears the evidence of being nibbled. I wonder where you put that hazelnut, Dorothy. Um, this is evidence of our human ancestors with the landscape that we had from Britain to Ireland in that bit of the middle, okay? Um, and they're just, they're, they're dropping some of, some of their food sources and these are being dredged up in the North Sea, for example, and these have been carbon dated to approximately eight and a half, nine thousand years ago in that landscape of Dogland where people were still able to get over to Europe before the first Brexit vote was taken, 8,000 years ago. Britain decided to be disconnected from Europe. Um, that's all the Conservative Party, yeah, they went all the way back there. Sorry, that's a terrible joke. Right, so we know, we know that this is a 10% of ice field on the planet, okay? Um, and that is why we're still in the ice age, because there's still ice there. Okay, job done.
Um, so we've still got some in a higher altitude, uh, uh, altitude as well in the light of um, the Alps and the light of uh, South America as well. But all the other things. What? We are in the Holstocene period. The Devonian ended 12,000 years ago. So th this is this is basically where we're at, and this is what I wanted to do. And now what we're going to do, we're going to get straight down to dot undies, and we're going to get straight into something we've actually already done. But we can't do Goss Cave without mentioning this briefly and quickly. In prehistoric Britain, cannibalism was practiced and ritualistic. Now we've got a bit more of this because I've got some more intriguing facts about cannibalism. Um, this is just God's Cave, dated from about 14,700 years ago. Uh, we've got human remains, human, uh, were on the menu for consumption by their own kind. And in Lantwerp Major, they didn't feel there's anything wrong with that. Here, you all felt there was something definitely wrong with it. Um, now, we know that the cannibalism was a little bit more popular in the past than, than we have it, give it credit for. A new analysis provides fresh insights uh, into the human defleshing that occurred at the site. Whether they boiled the meat first or whether they just defleshed it while the meat was still um, on flesh. Studies of fossil human cannibalism have traditionally focused on signs of bone damage from stone tools, cut marks from slicing muscle off the bone and percussion marks from extracting the nutrition, nutritious uh, marrow inside so as to differentiate between human activity and large cats. But now we know uh, that there are human teeth marks on the bone, uh, where they gnawed at the bone themselves. And a very interesting fact that I completely ignored to tell you the other time, and that, that's how well we did cannibalism, is simply this. Uh, these human bones were found and associated with other animal bones. Lots of other animal bones, meaning that they didn't have to eat this flesh at all to stay alive because they could get nutritional value of other beasts. Therefore, this was not random, this is what they did. And it's very important that you keep your hat on that until we get to it more appropriately in a few, um, in about 30 odd minutes. Right, now. What I'd like to do, um, I like to put a, a bit, bit academic stuff in here occasionally. The back there is the Cheddar Gorge. Here is the Cheddar Gorge, uh, which is a little bit more than a couple of um, uh, feet long. Um, it goes on for over <laughs> four kilometres. Um, that is where Goss Cave is by there. Um, Cheddar Gorge is an old image, and you'll notice if you go along to Cheddar Gorge, there is no river there today. Now, <laughs> many, many years ago, um, I was watching a program on television, and what it said was that lots of the valleys that we find in Britain, okay, once there was a huge glacier above, <laughs> and there was a, a rock underneath, and underneath that, there was a huge cavern, and as the, the ice mounted from above, because it was it was warmer below the ice because caves have the same temperature all year round. The ice melts and um, would um, start creating this, this sort of underground tunnel deeper and deeper and the weight of the ice above, the whole thing collapsed, creating Cheddar, uh, cheddar Gorge. That sounds plausible, but maybe it's not. Uh, there are different reasons why these gorges were formed. Some say it out of uh, melting ice, but look at this. Cheddar Gorge is a classic example of a waterless limestone gorge. Um, it is also one of Britain's greatest natural scientific attractions, opening to, into, um, into it a, um, several caves at different levels, whose origins are linked to the development of the gorge. Over half a million of one visitors visit um, Goff's Cave every single year. And why is it called Goff's Cave? It was found some people talk to God. <laughs> uh, it, it would be wonderful if I found an archaeological site and I could call it Langford's Archaeological Site. Oh. I was here, but unfortunately I would name it, it after Dorothy instead. Because uh, I'm expecting a special cake next week, that's what I'm saying. Right. Early speculation on the origin <coughs> of Cheddar Gorge ranged from earthquake rift into marine erosion. So basically they said the Cheddar Gorge was formed 
because uh, basically two bits in the earth crust overlap and there's a gap in between, that's the rift, like the rift valley, or it was formed because of water just eroding, eroding, eroding it away because it runs under the sea and all these silly things. But uh, these ideas were replaced in the later 1800s by the cavern collapse hypothesis. Um, and the interesting thing about this cavern collapse hypothesis uh, is that it, it was an idea that was still in the minds of people for a very, very long time. But unfortunately, that sort of changed as well. Present day views on dry valley formation were heralded in 1927, um, who argued that um, smaller dry limestone gorges uh, were eroded by a surface stream. So in other words, you've got a surface stream forming the valley, and that's how they were formed. This was possible because the ground was permanently frozen in the colder phases of the Pleistocene. But there is one little thing about all this that somebody mentioned the other week. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you about that yet. Um, and basically it said that it was formed by just a water stream removing the water. Others say uh, that in fact Cheddar Gorge is a simple youthful valley which has recently formed the typical youthful action of abandoning a surface course by an underground flood. Whatever that means, there was once a river above and now it's gone underground. Uh, and then the process will be repeated with the collapsing of and all the rest of it. So all these different theories to how these things are formed. Uh, but there is one very, very important thing about the Cheddar Gorge Valley. Okay? And it goes as follows. <coughs> in archaeology, what do I say in fact? That is wide awake to me. You've been on some in fact. <laughs> You've been on some of this. Um, there's one thing in the Cheddar Gorge that, that turns archaeology completely upside down. The, the oldest archaeology at Cheddar Gorge is at the top of the cliff, <coughs> and the youngest archaeology is down below. And why is that? It's quite simple, isn't it? Um, however this valley is being formed, the valley needs to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So what's happening is that the earliest people moving into the area are living um, off the valley in the top bit, in the caves up here. As the, valley's, as the valley gets deeper, they abandon the top caves, so let's say this is 14,000 years ago, and they go to a cave below. 10,000 years ago, they get eroded by the ice, they live down below. So in other words, the ones at the top, the caves at the top, are the, are the ones that have got all the most ancient stuff, the ones at the bottom have got the more newer stuff. And that turns out to be on the If you ask the question, has anyone explored the caves further up in the valley? Um, the, the cliffs at um, Cheddar Gorge are over 100 metres high. The answer is not very much. So, next, let's get straight to it. Um, a nice bit of information about this cave, and I've got a nice little map to show you as well. A cave which has produced one of the largest assemblages of archaeological material dating from the late glacial period, so 12,000 years ago, as well as significant finds of later date, including a Mesolithic skeleton known as Cheddar Man. Do you know what? I was going to ask you that? I was going to say, guess what the name of the person <laughs> with the skeletal remains, and I've blown it. I've said, what, what was the name of that man found in Goss Cave? Goss. No, it's Cheddar Man. <laughs> No, you didn't. You see, you didn't. The cave was discovered and first probably explored in 1892. <coughs> Richard Cox Goff, who was searching for a new shell cave to compete with others in the area. Now, Cox Goff uh, was one of these guys who was interested in archaeology as well. And he, he said that um, if we do find anything there, we'll display it to people if we can. Right? It's the same at Danarogov Showcase. At Danarogov Showcase, there's an area at Danarogov Showcase which is known as the Bone Cave, the human bones in it, still today, so that you can see and gnaw at for you, uh, your own delight, Glenda. Get in there. Get a bone and gnaw at it. Were you doing a bit of gnawing? No. I'm sure you did, Tiki Mac, my friend, is that? The same Tuff Mac as I found on my arm the other day when he bit me. Oh, um, anyway. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's what Alan told me. Uh, the cave entrance had been in use previously.
Shakespeare's A Cart Shed and Gambler's Den. And in the 1800s, almost the end of the 1800s, gentlemen loved their cage. Has anyone been to the, um, the World Fire Club um, cage uh, on the Dashwood Estate? And I can't remember that. It's a place um, northwest of London. Anyone know the place I mean? No. Yeah, well, any, yeah. you know the place I mean. And basically, they, were the, they set up a cage system, right? That had a chapel, uh, had a bordello, uh, had, um, ha, had a, a drinking den. Had a, you've been there, yeah? Yeah. And that was the whole thing. But what Cox Goff wanted to do was he wanted to get people into his cave and show them around. And now it's got half a million and one visitors every year. That one person's in, that one person's important because it's dark. Don't make a point. Uh, between 1890 and 1898, much settlement was removed, along with animal remains, plus print and bone artifacts, some of it recovered, and some of it used for later research, which was great. But this is really interesting. In 1903, blasting near the um, entrance resulted in the discovery of Cheddar Man. I knew you'd already forgotten that, Dorothy, but don't worry about it. Earlier accounts are far from ideal, uh, but the bones seem to represent sheep. <laughs> I said for nobody to interrupt you, you silly woman. It seems to represent the oldest fully articulated set of human remains ever found in Britain, where everything is on there, including the squeak. This body dates to approximately 9,000 years ago. And interestingly enough, Goff Koch realized the, the importance of these human remains even before radiocarbon dating. And he also said that he's going to take the bones away. He did a, a complete replica of the bones and plonk them into the place where the bones were found, which is great. Um, excavations have occurred a number of times at the cave, uh, finding various implements, um, including blocks of amber and so on, and also a baton de commandment. Baton de commandment is something that we'll come on to in a short while. Basically, it's a little thing for chucking sticks. So don't worry about the spelling of that. We'll be doing it in a few weeks anyway. Uh, the bulk of the finds seems to date to the period um, from about 13 to 14,000 years ago, where in all the way to the Mesolithic period, about 9,000 years ago. Any more bones in particular? Can it? A human and carnivore occupation, what we need, mean is that maybe beasts were dragging the odd animals in there to feast upon. Um, Flint, Cheddar Man, and other um, items point to some major um, preoccupation with the cave, but this is, this is an important point. It's nothing to do with what we're doing now, but it's chuckling. Bronze Age, Iron Age, and Roman period activity. So, in other words, the Romans are used in the cave as well, as much as the Iron Age people. In other words, the idea of George in his leather thong with a big club dragging a woman into the cave. And that's what I was going to say because I had the image of George in his thong in my mind. But um, that I, I don't think anything happened because you spent all your energy dragging the bloody woman. <laughs> <laughs> You've been that good. George, George, George has got a trick on his way. But anyway. The point is, it, um, people weren't just using uh, the cave in those uh, prehistoric times, they were actually using it in Roman times when um, George had a toga on, dragging a woman with red fiery hair into the cave. So there you go, that, that, that's George. George through the ages, Anne. Oh no, I, I had first dibs. Among the most significant of the earlier finds are the most recent recovered during small-scale excavations in 1984 and 1986, including a large number of human remains uh, with cut marks on, on all the remains that they found, that the skull cuts being used as drinking cuts, more information about that, fragments of mammoth ivory marked with linear incisions marks on them, um, some may indicate that um, they, they're keeping notes of something. Notes? 12,000 years ago, notation. Uh, deliberate marks on them. What they mean, we don't know. Um, ma other map of ivory, uh, baton de commandment, uh, made out of an anter, basically. I'll show you in a short while. Another word, uh, amber and various other uh, artifacts being found in there. 
Um, this thing about the mammoth is what we're doing next week. Okay? I always mention mammoth, but I never do them. So that's what we're doing next week. One thing I'm going to say, one thing I'm going to say, um, helps me a great deal. Um, when somebody said in my outside class, um, you know, your car, you're saying that they live in, in these caves, in these landscapes, 14,000 years ago, when it was freezing cold. Have you ever thought they didn't just live in the caves? Maybe there were microclimates in the areas. But suddenly you realize, yes, there would be areas where valleys and other areas would be much warmer than the surrounding landscape. These would be the reverse. In Wales, for example, we get low temperatures of minus 5 or minus 6 degrees. There are, at the same day, the same moment, and all the rest of it, there are parts of Wales that get minus 20 degrees centigrade temperatures. Microclimates. Why don't you reverse it around, okay? Uh, the ice has um, a protective effect as, uh, as um, as an igloo effect, that's what we're looking for, it's wonderful. As an igloo effect, and that caused you to have microclimate in places like the Cheddar Gorge, temperature could have been above freezing level, animals lived there, people lived there, job done, and I thought that was absolutely wonderful, um, somebody even mentioning that. Um, so here we go, um, we're going we're gonna to have a break um, in, in a few moments as well, so we can get on track. Um, I, I, I love this because um, n now you see it. No, you don't. <laughs> so this is basically um, the roadway that goes through the valley today, the cliff road for all. This road follow the Cheddar Gorge Valley, okay, for about 12 kilometres out of Cheddar itself. Goss Cave, um, and and now you got an aerial view. Isn't that good? Oh, you can walk along there. The road goes yeah, straight. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is it still I open? Don't you can drive. Oh. You used to be able to drive through. I'm not sure you can now. Yeah. Oh. I I know. I years ago, years ago, I remember we drove through a really narrow valley. I'm not sure you can. But there's still a roadway there. And obviously, you've got a roadway there. It's a lovely little thing. That's the point I'm trying to make. Um. So, um, are there any any quick questions on that? Because I'm gonna have a quick break. Well, hand it around. What are you messing around for? Okay, we're going to have a 10 minutes break straight down to your undies, and I'm going to have my chips. What is there for there? But when Bob first, he leased the cave from the master of the past, owned the land there. Yeah, it's quite, and yeah. A lot of the car park was put from the spoil from that cave. They, they dig it in the car park as well. No? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because obviously, um, you know, he's trying to create a showcase for anything that they wouldn't like, and they were keeping, but obviously it wasn't done archaeologically. Right, let's take a break. Down, straight down the middle. Do you know one thing I haven't shown you is any images, so I'm, I'm going to do this now, and um, I know you can hardly wait. Oh, your friends are there. <laughs> there you go. Um, and... Pat, that's where we're going to go. That's where we're going tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow and Friday and um, Saturday and Sunday. So there you go. Uh, so here we go. Oh, and also uh, another um, television series in Apartment 3. When is that on? Uh, and I can't say. That looks like that Aldo clown thing. Yeah, but base, base, basically we do over a clown. No, I can't stand that. Show. I can't stand the other. Um, now, Doss Cave, where are we? I can't get this larger. Oh, that's what uh, George has been saying all his life. Um, there you go. You can't see it properly. I know, that's what I'm saying. It's easier to see people see it now. <laughs> <laughs> that's Goss King, Somerset Way. There's Bridgen. Uh, I know you can't really see this kind well, but uh, 12,000 years ago, that's where the water was here. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then. Um, 8,000 years ago, it quickly becomes an island. That's where um, the coastline is. About 4,000 years ago, it's this white bit, and that's basically it. It's a really good plan, but it's a shame I can't enlarge it. There's something wrong with the setting. What? That's not the Blue Island Man, that's the Island Lundy. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a big mountain. That's what I say. Flat, flat home, steep home were, were, were hills. 
So a few years, just a couple of years earlier, not much, a couple of thousand. Yeah, 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 just been earlier, yeah. Only for 20,000, not much. It's, a, it's the age difference between Rob and George. Um, right, that man is called Goff. There he is, Goff, Goff, there he is. Um, they've, they've even got a statue of him. They have. They have? It wouldn't. I, I got a statue of me in the house so I could just creep out and leave Michelle talking to the statue. <laughs> the, the other the other night I I I I got a blow up rubber doll, right? So I put it on. Wait, you don't want to know. <laughs> anyway. She came on too. Yeah. Oh, what did you call her? Oh, what did you call her? Oh, the blow up rubber doll. Yeah. Oh, it's quite. No, we don't want to talk about the naked blow up rubber doll and this uh, this girl comes back. Right, let me. You, you, you need to come on these trips, Glenda. Let's go on with this. This is one of those skulls, that was, that was one of several skulls that was used as a skull cup. Um, some of those part of the bone assemblage, the cannibalized bone dated from 14,000 years ago. But um, let, let's let's move on a bit. Um, just want to show you these quickly. But look at that. I did show you that last time. Look at that. Um, that chuck there is the size of Glenda's incisor. It's one of her relatives, so they know that that. Um, and those are mine, do they look the gap? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Those were mine from 10 years ago. You wouldn't have believed it. No, I wouldn't. But anyway, there, there you go. Slicing cut marks and the, those cut marks themselves um, are, are deliberately placed. So they're, they're not from an animal. Yeah, 10 years ago, we would have definitely said that they, they were actually um, the, the tough marks of a hyena or a wolf or a bear, but now we know they're human. Anyway, move on, lots to do. Stop the clock, Annika Rice. You know, I used to really like that woman. Um, there you go, there's one of the skull cups. About seven or eight individuals found there. Um, several youngsters, a three year old, and several adults. There's some of the bones, they were used as skull cup, um, uh, cups. And she actually made a cup out of the. Yeah, that's right. right. You're basically, back part of it, cranium, job done. Um, in Time Team, a few years ago, about an episode from 20 years ago in Time Team, they were excavating a stone uh, burial chamber from the Bronze Age, known as the Kiss Burial, right? And they took the lid off, and they found one of those inside it, right? And it was full of straw and hay, right? And then the archaeologist took her out and said, this must have been a rat's nest, right? However, now we know um, that these could equally have been used as skull cups, they used them to drink out of, out of great respect for their loved ones, um, and so in other words, oh, lots of this stuff has to be reanalyzed. Moving on again. Um, um, okay, what's the deal? Is that a stalactite or a stalactite? Tights down. Tights go down and stalactites go up. Tights go up. Tights go up. Anyway, this is the image of God's cave still. Uh, more got there, can you see there, Cheddar Man, there, there he is, lying there, we'll, go, we'll do him in a minute. Where? Oh, we'll do him in a minute. Uh, but there, there we go, Mike's tights. Mike's tights. There he is, can you see him? That, 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 oh, oh, yeah, there. oh, you got that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Basically, the, that, that's a basically plastic version, but um, there you go. That's a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, we're looking from above down to there, yes. Um, so there you go, and um, there, there's another one, there he is. There's two there. There's one! Oh, no, no. I see legs, you silly... Oh, no, no. oh, oh. Uh, size isn't everything. No, oh, there you go. Like it, there. no, it's two of them. There's one! Oh. Just bolded up a bit. Oh, there he is. No, anyway, this is an artificial one showing you the locality, so you can go there and work out. So, stalactites? What year was the that? Um, he was found in 2003. Oh, no, he was found in 1903, and he dates back to just under um, 9,000 years ago. I'm messing with you. More of Goss Cave. Let's move on. And there's the skull. Now, interestingly enough about the skull, right? Oh, 
I gotta say this, right? Michelle's been ill for about a week and a half. Uh, she, she's had a really uh, headache. She's had a runny nose. Uh, she's been all coffee. She's been lying down, really severe flu-like symptoms, right? Uh, and I haven't caught it, and nor are the children. And I, unfortunately, she got really upset with me the other day because I said, Michelle, I got, I'm really excited because the virus that you've got because it, it's showing signs um, of Spanish flu. Because Spanish flu was a deliberate, was, was, was a byproduct of, of, of the gas and everything from the First World War. And when it, had, when it broke out in, in um, 19, um, 18, 19, 19, it wiped out 50 million people. And I said it only killed healthy people. This um, young people and elderly people were spared. They didn't get it. So I said, I'm really interested in your uh, virus. And she's not been too impressed with those comments. I've been, you know, saying, you know, I'm just writing it down. Writing things down. Uh, be because it was a disease that um, prob it was a virus that was probably developed from from warfare. And it was only killing off healthy men. Germ warfare. Anyway, so the reason why I mentioned that is that we've not only got a, a set of skeletal or remains which are practically complete, we've also got an abscess directly in the bone that's erupted. Okay, so we've got some kind of bacteria, we've got some kind of virus, it could even be leprosy, anything, right? So we've also got disease, and we've got this set of skeletal remains. I like disease, and do you know what? The way I communicate with my eldest uh, daughter, Bethany, is I do disease videos. She gets very excited when I talk about uh, syphilis and typhus and <laughs> uh, polio. She gets very excited, my daughter. She obviously follows you. <laughs> um, there you go. Can you see that there? Yeah. It is basically, that's about to rupture just by where the um, brain tissue is. It must have been painful. That was probably cause of death. But some archaeologists believe that the cause of death was, in fact, cannibalism. But the person was probably dead anyway. No squeezing. Oh, I love squeezing. I had, a, I had a spot on my bum the other day, and she wanted oh, to do oh, it. Oh, she should have called me. She's gone right downhill. Slender, you should record these classes and take it home to Alan, because he wouldn't believe it. You'd be surprised that I do these classes. Take photographs. Yeah, right, they've actually found cave art in Dog's Cave. This is why it's really amazing. Cave art, there you go. There's the, there's the man's back of his head. Uh, there he goes, a tusk, two tusks. And this is actually what they found. Is they, found uh, they found the contours of this part of the cave, and they felt right that would be perfect to portray a mammoth, so it's in relief. And then they found that there were little sort of lights coming from a pretty we could have a tusk out of that. So, tap a bit away. And then we'll outline it with a line, natural hole, and this is a place where you get early cave art. And this is why we do a mammoth next week, we do the night here, and we don't, we, no, most of us know very little about mammoths and what, when they become extinct and all the rest of it, and that's why we're doing it next week. More of these bones. Um, there's a little bit of an article associated with it. We'll come back to cannibalism in a sec. We'll do Cheddar Mound first. And on these bones, you can't see them, but you can see them in a clear image coming out. Can you see the little chevrons? But we'll leave that for now because I've got a close up. Um, and mammoths next week. This fascination with our ancestors is they respect mammoths. Do we have bone? Look, you know, we, we've got mammoth skull associated with um, the, the latest mammoth cave, right? Was it the mammoth skull there as a matter that they had butchered the mammoth and they brought all the meat in there? Or they respected the mammoth and they wanted to be associated with the power of the mammoth, okay? We don't know, but um, that's why we're doing mammoths next week. This is um, from Col Colombia, um, South America, and you can see that there, you've got a huge mammoth, perfectly preserved, but we have got mammoth remains like this that have also been found in Britain. I need to think you are. Okay, have any of you ever seen the film The Day After Tomorrow? Yeah. There's a lot of scientific fact in there, and there's this idea, um, and they got this from these mammoths, because what they do, they find mammoths, right? Uh, that that uh, that are in full in, in full sort of uh, grass, right? And they they got um, they got grasses and mosses in their mouths that they're chewing, right? And they just kill over and die. And they believe that's because suddenly there was a cold spell that came down within seconds and just killed them. And that's another piece of evidence like that. And I, that that piece of information came from. Um, 
some scientific research, but it was used in the, in the film Day After Tomorrow. Worth watching that film. Um, this is known as a uh, baton de commandment. Basically, what you would have done, um, you held that, you said it's not, it's only that thing, you held that, and then you used it as a throwing stick, as they have in Aboriginal Australia. I'm not really interested in that in this minute, because we'll be doing that in a few weeks. But notice the horse. We did a day school about horses. The, the um, Kevin Dool and the Mary Lloyd and, and all the rest of it, um, a Poma and all the rest of it, as the symbolism of the horse. And this goes way, way back. Uh, this goes back to 12, 11,000 years ago. We, we've always had the Fredvalski horse, by the way. And there I am. Right, so uh, moving on. Now, what I, what I want, I've, I've got, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep with this for now, actually, and uh, Cheddar Man. We've got all this, we've got the lesions there in the skull, um, and some say that this individual died from the lesion in the skull, um, basically the huge abscess. Others believe he was deliberately killed, but well, we can't really know what's going on. A replica of the skeleton is exhibited in Cheddar Man um, Museum in Cheddar Village. The death of Cheddar Man remains a mystery. A hole in his skull suggests violence. Um, that doesn't, does it? Uh, I think while they're talking about this, another hole in the skull. I remember mentioning years ago about this skull when they first found it. Uh, no, not when they first found it, because I don't go back to my memory. When it first became public about this skull, um, and they made um, a BBC program on it as well. They said that uh, this person had been murdered because there was another hole in the skull, um, and this this person was was eaten. But then I remember saying, actually, the bones themselves, the set of human remains are intact. If you're going to kill somebody and eat them, the bones are going to be all over the place. Yeah. Um, you know. Oh, by the way, Rob, we'll finish eating the skull. Here we, here we go. Bit of fava beans. Get the skull there. <laughs> A few fava beans, there you go. Like a bit of that. Put the skull back there, lovely. What we'll do, we'll break a bone open and we'll glue it all back together. You don't see that with this individual, so it's unlikely <laughs> that he was um, that he was a victim of being cannibalized, okay? Depending on which way you look at it. Some say that um, he was just laid out, buried. Others, that it might be to say, make a point. This is our cave. This is one of our loved ones. Uh, please be respectful. And people were so respectful, they were still there until 1903. So it seemed to do the trick. Um, what's that? No, nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. The idea of warfare and ritual, forget about that back then, but I do have a date, I, I do have a class in the next few weeks about ritual as well. But I think this bit is absolutely amazing. Mito mitochondrial DNA testing. A certain uh, Professor Brian Sykes of Oxford University mitochondrial DNA um, exacting of Cheddar's Cheddar Man. Basically, uh, his molars were looked at. Um, I'll explain all this. Basically, what you do is you take sample out of a molar and then it is pure um, because the pulp within the molar itself is sealed and you can get dating from it. Intact, uncontaminated dating. Keep that in mind. Cheddar Man uh, determined to belong to a certain group uh, of people in Europe. Only 10% of the people in Europe are known from this Hapelberg group. Um, and it, it was dated, um, dated it to 9,000 years ago, the individual, the bones. However, um, earlier dates said that the skeletal remains were a lot earlier. However, um, that was because the bones had been contaminated. You can remember in 1903, right? They go, oh, yeah, I'm going to look at the okay? They're going to go in there and say, look what I found. I found a nice bone. So that the area contaminated. So we couldn't take that risk and it being washed and all the rest of it. So we get to cut it out of the tub. So this next bit is here. Um, we filmed it in 1997. I like this bit. As a means of connecting Cheddar Man to the living residents of Cheddar Village, you compare mitochondrial DNA taken from 20 living residents of the village to, the, uh, to that extracted from Cheddar Man's molar. He found two people who shared the same mitochondrial DNA as Cheddar Man, because around 10% of the Europeans belong to half of those groups. But the specific train, strain of DNA, right, matched somebody in the village, smack on. Bang, smack on. 
And, and to be honest, you know, I'm glad you said that. If we stop now, we didn't, we've well, we've gone for about another quarter of an hour, but now, but if I stop now and gave you that fact, it's a brilliant fact, and you know why? Uh, it proves one thing: you know, people have lived in this country without being wiped out by fictitious inflations and caps and all the rest of it. They lived in this country, paid yeah. class, particularly in Cheddar, for over nine thousand years, and I think that is absolutely amazing. It is amazing. So we're gonna we're gonna dart we're gonna dart back into this now. This is this is more about the other bones, okay? Now I'm gonna paraphrase some of this because I don't want to repeat too much. But if we look at that, you clearly see it there. Yeah. So what somebody's doing is they they've got a bone jaw and you've got scratch marks there, and then a little bit later on they've got more scratch marks there. You've got a load of scratch marks there, a little bit later, because these are what you see. All these scratch marks, these chevrons going all the way over the bone, right? That's not animals' teeth, that's not human teeth. Jesus, mate. No, I, I, basically, um, but actually, it answers it in a, in a while, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I've done this a few times now. Um, if you're trying to deflesh bone, right, boil it first, right, but if you're trying to get the last bits off, um, you will try and avoid um, the, the tool that you're using getting blunt. So you would try to avoid scraping the bone um, as much as you possibly could. To have all these marks in regular intervals, they're all deliberate. They actually mean something. They're, they're actually saying that we want you to know that these are here. They, we want you to know that we've done this. They're broadcasting something. If, if you want to just, if you're going to just eat the flesh and just toss away the bone, just go ahead. But they're not doing that. This has got a great powerful meaning to them. Really great powerful meaning. Um, so... No, they, they, um, the thing is, they were found with other animal bones and so on. They may have been. But they may have been. But the problem is, um, with this cave, it's been flooded and changed and all the rest of it, so they could have been moved around. Anyway, um, the experts said, obviously, we, we've, we've done this already about Hannibal Lecter and cannibalism. <laughs> Um, but this is not the Hannibal lecture type of cannibalism. And I have to look at the site, Goss Cave. Um, it said that this is not the work of serial killers, okay? This is the work of, of people who are eating flesh and they're very respectful of the people's flesh that are eating. Mind you, sure signs of a serial killer is somebody who keeps a daily diary, okay? Because all serial killers keep a daily diary. Um, and they keep a very exacting day, daily diary. You know, they write so much detail in it. You know, I'm not trying to sell you on the serial killer. There's a few people been going and missing in Barry recently. Um, anyway, thousands of years. Oh no, I wouldn't go as far as that. I mean, I mean, no. See where the Russian people let me even say it. They just found them. Did anyone see that? No. A few weeks ago, two Russians. They were only in their forties. They'd been killing young girls and eating them. And there was a photograph. She used to like decorate. You know, like. You Yeah, thanks for that. Let's move on. Um, so here we go. Was it was it a, a funeral custom? Was it out of respect? Nutrition ritual? Um, you know, there's all loads of um, other food around there, so they didn't particularly need the nutritional value. Goss cave, butchery marks, human tooth imprints, uh, gnawing at the ends of toes and rib bones. Uh, but the bones also seem to have been used in cultural ways as well. This here, that we didn't do this last time, zigzag patterns on the human arm bone. Does that mean ritual or does it mean something else? Um, something a little bit more closer to what they believed. Um, described, obviously, the skulls. We mentioned the, the skull um, craniums were actually used for drinking out of. Um, butchering marks on human and animal bones from Goss Cave, as well as engravings on animal bones from the cave and other archaeological sites. So, this treatment is only, isn't only given to human bones, it's given to animal bones as well. The cut marks on the arm bones were unlike butchering incisions, the researchers found. It seemed that whoever made the marks deliberately 
sawed the bone back and forth to make the marks deeper, wider and more visible. In contrast, when taking meat off a bone, one typically wants to minimize the number of cuts. Um, well, they had loads of cuts in the 1970s, didn't they? Yeah. Because this would be a gift. As a joke, uh, sorry. This would be a gift from person, though, because the Mitchell shared about it, and he was 10,000. 9,000 years ago. This guy is 15,000. Exactly, it's completely different. So, since repeating scraping against bone makes one flay blunt, it's unlikely that this was done by accident. The zigzag design on the arm bones match patterns on engraved animals, animal bones found in France from the same period suggested it was a common motif during that time. So in other words, it was common practice to um, engrave uh, these sort of chevron designs on the bone. There you go, you can just basically say it there. Um, that's, that's at least on four bones. Because heaps of animal um, uh, remains were also found in Goss Cave. The researchers suspect that the people back then were not starving. There was also no obvious signs of injury on the human remains, so these people were not murdered. They died naturally, which suggests that these people died from natural causes and were then eaten. Um, it's a bit of a waste, isn't it? You know, um, It's possible that people practiced cannibalism as a way to dispose um, of or even honor the dead. I, I was doing. I was saying this today. I was in full flow today, and um, and, I, and I, then I turned around and said, um, actually, um, the way we treat our loved ones in this country is atrocious. You know, we, we somebody dies, and we want to get them underground, and we're told to forget them straight away. And and every and I thought everyone in the room agreed with me on this, and then suddenly one said, yeah, um, that's the best way to deal with somebody who's just died, and I was quite shocked. But then again, I realise that everybody's got different ways of dealing with somebody that's died. And this is the way they... Actually, that's the point. In the past, they dealt with their loved ones in different ways. Um, and engraving the bone might have been a way to extend the memory of the deceased before the body was broken down. Because um, all the flesh was already eaten, so I think they've got that wrong there. In fact, we may never know what people who lived that long ago were thinking. Um, what's clear though um, is that such things as how we treat the dead and what we deem acceptable to eat have constantly shifted through history actually a few years ago um, I can remember being offered monkey brain to eat I, mean, I was offered monkey brain and I didn't eat it uh, but somebody casually said do you want to try this monkey brain yeah they do it was in Greece a few years ago um, anyway, moving on, folks. Um, I thought this was this was this was fascinating. Okay, Paleolithic mammoth engravings in Goss Cave. Um, Goss Cave. Well, we've done all that. We know where that is. Um, Paleolithic uh, parental cave art, which is art within a cave. Um, up until uh, 2003, we found in Creswell Crag, but nowhere else since then. We found it on the Gower. Um, at uh, Cathole Cave, and we've got it at Gox Cave as well. This cave is situated immediately uh, below Long Hole, in which can be found engravings of probable Mesolithic age. Um, much of the rock, when it says below, I don't mean in height, I mean down the valley. <coughs> much of the rock surface in this cave has been modified since it was opened. However, during a careful search of the remaining original surface by the author, um, in, on the 22nd of June 2003 at 4.15 and 3 seconds, it is located um, in a small alcove on the south side of the show cave between um, wherever the fonts are and the blasted area is. So they found it. So this was a, a, an area that hadn't been touched. And again, that's what they found. So when I'm reading this out, right, we'll try and match the description. Um, oh, my God. I've uh, scrolled up too much. It's, uh, it's Glenda's fault. Yeah. Um, so here we go. Um, indicating, so what we've got, line drawings of the possible mammoth figure, which are these. Okay. Um, and, and basically the natural parts there. Um, so these, these are the signs of human workmanship. And this can be most clearly seen at the back of the head. Uh, the remainder of the line on the back of the dome of the head, although clearly a single feature, is faint and partly infilled with sediment 
the, you know, the, the silica and the, um, the lime and the calcite sort of building up as minerals, um, giving it its like, sense of date. And, and that, that's the thing. Where, where are all those fibers? Right, here's a fiber. So what, what, you, what you can imagine, right, um, is that when you've got an engraving, after a, every few years, right, as, as the sort of minerals um, come down the rock, a layer, a layer is, oh, see how rubbish these are? All right, a layer, there, there it is there. One layer, and then you've got another layer, and you've got another layer, and another layer. So thousands of years go by, you've got so many layers, but these are so small. Um, and you can count and date, work out the length of these layers, and actually work out the date. Um, so there we go. But you can work out the date because the fact it's a mammoth being portrayed. You can't just make up what a mammoth looks like. If you did, you'd end up with 12 tusks. Um, however, the cave, including the area in which the feature is located, has been subject to repeated flooding. Um, a line of this shape and type is not uh, replicated elsewhere on the rock wall, either in direction or in texture. It does not follow the grain um, of the rock and has a distinctive appearance from the obvious um, natural lines on the alcove wall. Certainly, there is no line which either takes the same direction or shows similar changes of direction to this one. So, in other words, it was created by man. However, the engraved li lines were complemented by natural features, um, natural sort of, in Lascaux in France, right, the, the, um, the bison themselves are in release and relief. So you get big fat bellies of the bison, right? It hunts on the rock and then the rest of it's painted in and lined in. That's what we're talking about this. Latter parts of a higher relief which are, which are raised um, than the rest of the figure and seem to be in keeping with the texture of the remaining part of the rock the incorporation of natural features into an engraving is, is a phenomenon that is known throughout Paleolithic Europe, France, Spain, and so on. Given the still somewhat controversial nature of Creswellian uh, finds up in Derbyshire, we approach the authenticity of this find with a degree of care. This find was carefully recorded, photographed, laser scanned, and so on. Uh, we also so, um, sought the opinion of other experts that proved that this was actually very genuine. Goss Cave, overall, in conclusion with all this, um, has yielded much archaeological material over the past uh, century and beyond. Uh, lithic finds, um, radiocarbon dating. In summary, it can be said that the site was used by late Upper Paleolithic hunters from the beginning of human recolonization of British Isles and about the start of the last glacial uh, interstadial, uh, which um, for more than a millennium, though, to the latter part of the interstadial, which it was deserted. The same, uh, the Britain in the cold time was abandoned. We now know that that's simply not the case. We know that people are still in Britain. Um, after the cold event, no, um, as the younger dry, I forget that, the site was reused in the early Mesolithic period, at which time the skeleton known as Cheddar Man was interred. Both of these periods have produced parental art, art in rock representational art such as a mammoth. So mammoths must have been around for them to have drawn them in the first place. The last mammoth, it said, I will disagree with this next week, I disappeared around 12,000 years ago. Uh, whether there were any in southern England at any point during the last uh, glacial um, extent, 13, 14,000 years ago, is debatable. But these people actually drawing mammoths, so they must have existed. It is also the case that artifacts of mammoth ivory have been found at varying caves uh, in Britain, including the cave on the Gower. Uh, uh, ivory rods from Goss Cave have been directly dated to approximately 12,170 years ago. It is therefore clear that the inhabitants of China would have been familiar with mammoths. If they were familiar with mammoths, they must have ex existed. Um, artistic parallels. Um, there are mammoths uh, found um, carved in rock in France and Spain. Um, up to 300 have been found in various different, um, um, you know, some, some look simple, um, some are advanced, some are character, caricatured mammoths. But they had a great respect for these mammoths, and to, cari to caricature a mammoth is probably giving fun on a creature that you're very familiar with. And maybe you're not threatened by. 
Photographic and laser recording seem to support the observation that the engraved lines visible on the alcove wall may um, constitute a deliberate drawing. No similar marks have been seen on the walls of this cave elsewhere. Some parts of the figure are clearly natural in origin, but the line of the head and the back show features consistent with it having been engraved using stone tools. These have been partly obscured uh, by various sediments and alteration by flooding. The figure appears to be that of a mammoth um, and to some time um, whilst the ice is still across our landscape around 12 to 13,000 years ago. And this was carved by a human being that was able to know what the mammoth looked like to have carved it in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to see if I can open that. If I can't, no, I can't. Um, and just one last thing to close with, uh, because I've actually done everything I need to do. Uh, we'll just do this quickly. We do these in a few weeks. You've got one, two, three for advanced horses. Um, Batten the commandment, basically, with the throwing tools, throwing sticks. Uh, but we'll be doing this again. A few of these have been found uh, at our cave, at uh, Goss Cave. You can see the horses there. Beautiful. Again, the representation of the horse is a very powerful thing alongside mammoths in the past. And then I'm just going to finish with, um, with this. The various animals have been found and um, evidence from the cave dated from 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. For example, Ring and Carver Gates tells us uh, they've got remains of horse, deer, even red Arctic hair before 12,000 years ago. Um, and about 10,000 years ago, you've got reindeer, and you've got the Sega antelope in there as well. All, all this archaeological evidence in bones found in the cave. Um, and uh, we've got even evidence of huge cow-like creatures known as auric. Um, and if I read this whole thing out, which I'm not going to because we're going to finish now, but one thing I would say, um, they were also excavating, and they found the remains of sheep, and one of my favourite animals, Dorothy. Exactly. They found all these bones in the cave as well. It's a wonderful archaeological site. I'm sure Cheddar would be a wonderful site to visit. The, the cave and the museums in Cheddar. Um, I'm not going to organise an archaeology camera trip there because entrance alone would cost £20. So I can imagine it would be a £60, £70 pounds trip. But I'm not going to do that. Um, anyway, um, are there any questions on any of that today? No. I would say that um, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, the thing is, if you've got a microclimate, right? Yeah. If you've got a microclimate which which preserves a, a, a more warmer, sensible climate for people to live in, they wouldn't want to leave that valley. And the other thing as well, um, Bobber, right? Um, you've got a valley like this, and you've got a gorge to get from there to there. You've got to pass down the valley, right? With animals can't go back up the valley because they've got 40 kilometres to come along that valley. It's, the, it's the 100 plus uh, metres in height that valley. So if you're an animal, if you have a herd of animals, you just need a small group of people, and they, they could. They wouldn't, they wouldn't take off any animals, they just wait for the ones at the back who are just plodding along the one path, almost looking as if they were going to drop dead, then they take them off. Um, and the animals can't come back and sort of do damage to you because they're already facing that way. Or is it like a sort of constant uh, population? Or? I, I, I would say a constant population, it's, it looks really balanced to me, yeah. yeah. It's a wonderful locality. How old was Cheddar Man? How old was that man? Approximately 9,000 years ago. No, no, no. How old was it, oh, we haven't got an age at all, but sensibly, um, he, um, I can't really guess, maybe 30 years old, from what I'm seeing, yeah, something like that, yeah. It's just as old as Alan, isn't it? Alan's probably the average age of a lifetime, maybe he's not ever seen. Same age, yeah. Maybe many living over 40 years, that's the best age, I think. It's a, it's a very difficult question, because life was so hard, uh, you know, it would be very difficult. The problem is, it's not the, so much as a life expectancy, it's the dangers, the, the perils of the landscape. If you are lucky, you might live a considerable time. But because you are on the go and you needed to be active all the time, you, you were 
more prone to be killed. It's the same thing, it's the same thing as this, right? Somebody has evangelated and they've sat down and done the maths. If human beings could live forever, most of us would be dead um, by about our 400th year. Because we would, we would, we would, we would, there would be an accident, and all we would, that's what I'm saying, right? E even if we could live forever, even if we could live forever, right? It's unlikely we could live, if somebody sat down and averaged this out, would be, uh, you think, a high child mortality then? Uh, very, very high. All the way up to the modern age? Very high mortality. Yeah. Because, um, th again, there's so many risk factors. There is. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah, what would you do with the dead body then if you don't believe in burying them and cremating them? Who, me? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, if you had a son that was in a very bad car accident, you wouldn't want to keep him, like, would you? Oh, right, I see you looking a bit more at the back. I see you looking a bit more at the back, uh, at the box. He said he didn't like out the way. That's right, you're talking about today, aren't you? Yeah. 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 yeah, I thought, well, he actually, said, actually, actually I'll, I'll infer it, send it back into the past and now. Um, you, you the, 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 the individual, whatever you can collect from the individual, um, that would be cherished back in the past. Today, we don't have that ability to do so. Um, but I, I, I'm sure that anyone who's got a child who's been involved in an accident, I'm sure the parent would love to be able to see that child. But unfortunately, the state prevents the parent from us from doing so, which I think is wrong. But that's me. Anyway, any other questions? No, we've got no wrong. Uh, okay, then. If there's no more questions, have you all enjoyed today? Thank you very much. Next week. Thank you. Exactly. Oh, love it. Yes, all gathered together. That's what streams do. That would be great. That would be great. Right, anyway, straight down to the Andes.